Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. On this Monday. Kind of cold Monday. Kind of cold, cloudy, cool, all that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was kind of dragging a little bit, so Patty made me a nice cup, cup. of cu a cup of joe, joe. mid-afternoon. Full caffeine load right now. Yes. I can do that till about 4 o'clock, but four, I have to stop because otherwise we, we I'll be up We have a very short night, window at that point. <laughs> so maybe like right after lunch, you know, because we tend to eat lunch a little bit late. Right after lunch, um, I have a little cup of joe here, so you... You know, not something I usually do, but I'm doing it today, That's by so golly. That's good. What a splurge. <laughs> Black coffee. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the Methodist men's golf tournament was today, I think. Um, what a lovely day, really, for golfing. And the, the rain high. held off. That's I went out great. to walk this morning and got out, I don't know, a certain distance. All of a sudden, it come down. It started to come down pretty hard. So I realized, no, I better turn around and go back. And Patty called, and she wanted, she offered to come pick me up. I did. But I was still rolling close enough to the house. And then you know what? Nothing came of it. That's so weird. I could have pressed on maybe. You probably could have. But I was pretty wet already. You were. <laughs> <laughs> I was. So anyway, so, we are glad that y'all are here. We are. You know, we couldn't meet last Monday. Remember? Didn't meet last Monday because my computer was That's still in the shop. Right. My computer crashed the Tuesday before. That's and when we right. talk crashed, I mean obliterated right. they they had to replace the logic See how board quickly i forget <laughs> yeah <laughs> they had to replace the logic board in the machine so all this time we've left moses right there at the bottom of mount sinai having ground He's the golden waiting. calf <laughs> into powder <laughs> that's so yeah yeah that's what we've been so anyway we're glad that all of we you are, are very here glad you're here and, and um, things have really you know i don't know if some of you may have not gone back to church yet but Really, the last two or three weeks, attendance is up so much more. I mean, it's... Yeah, people are coming back in person to yeah. worship. And Sunday Classes class went well, went well yeah, again yesterday. Right. And, and um, so things are changing. They are changing for the, for better. the better. For the for better. For the better, yeah. 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 So we're so excited about that. And... I guess, you know, without further ado. I would add something, but I'm drinking coffee instead. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I hope all you moms had a great Mother's Day. Yeah. Since he's drinking coffee, I'm going to give a 15-second free plug to the restaurant we ate at last night. Robbie and Savannah took us out to a new Frisco location of a restaurant that they like downtown because they um, that's where they live. And... Um, what it was, you guys may know about it, but it's on Preston Road, close to 121, and it's called DeLuca Gaucho. And what it is, it's kind of like, you know, like those Brazilian uh, steakhouses where they come around with all the cuts of meat? But what they come around with is all different kinds of pizza. So you first served like a little salad, appetizers were meatballs. I love meatballs. These were really good. Uh, a little bit of soup. And then they have 10 or 12 different kinds of pizzas, including like tiki masala, Indian pizza, Mexican lamb, pizza. Lamb, the Turkish lamb was lamb, good. That was lots good. of steak pizzas. It was it was really it's good. Kind of and then there was, was a fun. number of um, dessert pieces. Yes. Pizzas. Like uh, Nutella, Nutella pizza. <laughs> banana pizza. Uh, Lucha, how do you say that? De leche, whatever. Dulce de leche, leche or something, something like, like that. that. I don't know. Anyway, um, <laughs> it's really moderately priced. They have a big wine list and everything, but it's in the location that used to be the old Panera Bread Company on... I thought it was Paradise Bakery, you told me. Yeah, I think... No. It, you, well, whatever, whatever, whatever. One of those. Whatever. Anyway, it's anyway. huge inside. There's lots of, yeah. of uh, seating. And I thought, like, for some small groups, like Bible studies and stuff, our big Bible study couldn't... Uh, it's way too big. But what a fun place yeah. for that. You fun. know, it would be fun. Anyway... I go. did that absolutely free, and I hope somebody from there heard me and is going to send us a gift card, but I doubt it. <laughs> yeah, not likely. Not likely. Okay. Uh, let's All pray. All right, let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be gathered here today, um, and we uh, pray that your Holy Spirit, who is with us in all things and at all times, uh, will especially today lift us up and encourage us and help us to grasp um, the importance of the story that we're in about this uh, golden calf and, and Moses uh, and um, his and our relationship with you. It's an important story. Help us to take away from it a lot about who you are and who we are and, and um, your 
your purpose, your purposes in this world. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. Very good. Yeah. You can tell the folks when you told Arthur where we were going, what he compared it to. <laughs> he said, so when I described it to him, he says, oh, that sounds like a high-end CC's. Well, I mean, it kind of is, you know, except they don't have tiki masala and Turkish lamb pizza at at, at at CC's, nor do they bring it to you, nor can you buy, nor can you buy bottles of wine at CC's. So anyway, a lot, lot of fun. And robbing Savannah said the one downtown was more fun. So anyway, so let's get started. So we are in Exodus 32, and we are going today go to the book of, of Kings and look at another golden calf story. But But first of all, since we were not able to meet last week, let's just get back. Get, let's just get back into this. So Moses has been up on the mountaintop, and while he is up there, God tells him that there is something very much amiss. Because down at the bottom, the people have, you know, Moses has been gone forty days or so, something like that, and they have come to Aaron and said, "Well, what do we do?" And Aaron has said, "Well, let's do this. Let's make this." golden calf and everybody's taken off their gold um, earrings and everything and they have fashioned this golden calf and they're um, now really worshiping it. They're, they've forgotten the promise they made to God just a short time before. And um, it's important to know that in the early portion of chapter 32, God is already saying, well, in essence, this is not working out. This is this is not working out. Um, uh, so here's what I'm going to do, Moses. I'm going to forget these people, and I am going to make you into a great nation. We'll start over again. It's another one of the another one of these restarts. Well, so it's going to start over, and and I'm going to start over with you, Moses. But, but Moses refuses, and we'll see that that's really an introduction to what is coming in terms of the intensity of the relationship between God and Moses um, up on the top of Mount Sinai. So, um, God relents, uh, and Moses then descends the mountaintop and with the tablets that are the work of God. These are these are tablets inscribed by God, um, engraved there on the tablets. And look at verse 19, which is approaching where we where we stopped. Two weeks ago. Okay. So when Moses approached the camp and saw the calf, this golden idol, and the dancing. His anger burned, and he threw the tablets that had been engraved by God out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. And he took the calf the people had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder, scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. So... I'm guessing drinking water infused with gold powder is probably not good, so we want to hang on to that to that little piece of it. Verse 21, um, he, Moses said to Aaron, What did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? So before we go on, I, I think we should probably go to the passage from, from Kings because it is a it is a second golden calf story and it's really n nearly as distressing as this one this one is sort of the original sin story for the israelites the the other one from the book of, from the book of kings is though it's it's really about as bad and it needs a little bit of setup so why don't you start making your way to first kings chapter 12 verse uh, 25, I think. I wrote that down. Yes, I'm right. 1 Kings 12, um, chap ver 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 25. 
So I need to need to put a little context around this to, for you to really grasp what is happening. Um, this is, let me go on one. This is a map of the kingdom of Israel under the rule of Solomon. There are three kings of the united Israel where all 12 tribes come together and they all are ruled by one human king above their tribal chieftains and stuff. The first one is Saul. The second one is David. The third one is Solomon. And under Solomon, the kingdom reaches its height of power and wealth. It's in Solomon's reign that they actually build the temple for God in Jerusalem. Um, and you can see it's, it's rather extensive um, from way in the north down into the south toward, toward Gaza and on the other side of the Jordan River as well, where some of the tribes had settled. You'll notice, look on the Mediterranean, on the southern part of the Mediterranean coast, you can see the area called Philistia. That is the area of the Philistines and the Philistine cities. Um, but but it's, a, it, it's a sizable kingdom. So what happens is when Solomon dies, his son Rehoboam takes over. And Rehoboam, this is how I always put it, he's an idiot. He's an idiot. The tribe, there's a great amount of tension between the tribes anyway, because the tribe of Judah has grown to be very, very large and and um, out of proportion to the rest of the tribes. And there are geographic tensions and just, I don't know what, the tensions that arise between people. They're tribes. Tribalism afflicts us still, doesn't it? Today, even 2021. So there's a lot of tensions and between the northern tribes and the tribe of Judah. And so Rehoboam, um, uh, from the tribe of Judah, Solomon's son, takes over and basically says to the northern tribes, well, you know, and I know you kind of chafed under my father's rule, but you think that was bad. I am. Wait till you, wait till you see what I'm going to do. And there is a very capable administrator in the kingdom by the name of Jeroboam, Jeroboam, J-E-R-O-B-O-A-M, Jeroboam. And the northern tribes, really led by Jeroboam, decide to part ways with, this, with the tribe of Judah. Like I said, those tensions go back to the time of David, um, and 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 but but now they make they make what is really a clean break and they establish the northern kingdom of Israel um, separate from the southern kingdom of Judah right so there's one little tribe the little tribe of Benjamin it's really really small it is also in the south with Judah um, uh, not of much note so there are 10 northern tribes two tribes in the south, giant Judah and tiny Benjamin, okay? And this map fairly represents the 10 northern tribes. So for 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 Bible deophytes, oh gosh, I shouldn't say that, really people who have been around the Bible a long time, this is easily confusing because once this happens in 922 BC, that's what we're, that's what we're talking about, 922 BC, the Old Testament talks about the kingdom of Israel alongside the kingdom of Judah, right? Um, and and it is confusing in the timeline. This ha this lasts for a couple hundred years until the Assyrian Empire uh, wipes out the ten northern tribes of Israel, and they basically drop out of existence. They become the ten lost tribes of Israel. So now, with all of that. As a marvelous setup, we'll come back to this uh, map in a second. Oh gosh, I need to find my own way to the book of First Kings. Twelve. What is, and what verse is it, Patty? Twenty-five. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So then Jeroboam fortified Shechem 
in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. And from there he went out and built up uh, Penuel. So as long as I have the map up, let me show you. So you can see where Shechem... Um, this map is... I like this map a lot. Um, it has actually two little squares that show you where Jeroboam built sanctuaries. One in Bethel in the south and way up one in the north. It shows you Samaria, the political capital of the northern kingdom of Israel, and just south of there is Shechem. So Jeroboam, the real leader of this rebellion, it's coffee break, the leader of this rebellion has, um, has gone there and, and built himself a home and a meeting place, and it's sort of uh, conveniently located, right? And then he's built another place a little bit to the east at Penuel, which figures elsewhere in the Bible. And then verse 26. And he thought to himself, Jeroboam does, you know, the kingdom will now likely um, revert to the house of David. Yeah, we've separated and all, but you know, these 10 northern tribes are going to make their way back to the house of David, to the tribe of Judah, to Solomon, to Rehoboam. Why? For 27. If these people go up to offer sacrifices at the temple of Yahweh in Jerusalem, they will again give their allegiance to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah. They will kill me and return to king Rehoboam. So you ask yourself, while I'm finishing this coffee, <laughs> is that not is, I mean, he's probably right. The temple is essentially brand new in the big scheme of things. And these are, they're, they're all the family of Abraham. They're all Israelites. They're all people of the covenant. And um, the temple belongs, which is God's home, was built by them all. And so, yes, so as the ten northern tribes begin to make their way to worship in Jerusalem, what's likely to happen? Well, things will get mended. And the Israelites will all come back together under the leadership of Rehoboam, because he's the king of Judah. He's the one from the house of David. God had promised that one from the house of David would sit on the throne and and yada, 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 and guess who would be left out? It would be Jeroboam. So, verse 28, after seeking advice, the king, this is Jeroboam, so he's calling himself king, because he's the king of the northern um, kingdom. The king made two golden calves, and he said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Mm. You could hear Patty moaning on the other side of the office here, right? This is, oh my gosh, this is like a replay of what happens down at the bottom of, of Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. This is, this is hitting replay on the original sin, and he's doubled down. He's got two of these, two of these. Verse 29, one he set up in Bethel, and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin. The people came to worship the one at Bethel and went as far as Dan to worship the other. So let me just put the map up again. How many years, Scott, is this? How many hundreds of years is this between these two? Between what two? The Exodus story and this one here. In Let's say Kings. 1500 to 900. So that would be 600. Okay. You know, the timing of the Exodus, people just don't agree. For some people, it's a little more like 1,500. For some people, it's more like 1,300. So give or take, you, you know, know, half a millennium. Jeroboam, though, probably knew this story, right, of Exodus. Oh, sure he does. So, he, I mean, he knows how horrible it was the first time. That's what makes this all the worse. Wow. I mean, if you don't know it, if you're a Hebrew... In Israel, and you don't know any other story, you're going to know the story um, of the golden calf at Mount Sinai. And yet he does this. And yet thing. he does he does this. You know how how 
Yeah. So so look at the map, and again, the, the little, there's two little boxes that say Jeroboam built a sanctuary. So there's one in the south, sort of marking the southern border with the kingdom of Judah, and one way up in the north at Dan, which is the, the, the northernmost tribe of Israel. And so that way these two um, altars are kind of marking out the perimeter, marking out the boundaries in that way of the kingdom of, of Israel. So let's just read on just a little bit because I want you to see everything that he, that he does. So Jer verse 31, Jeroboam built shrines on high places and appointed priests from all sorts of people, even though they weren't Levites. He instituted a festival on the 15th day of the eighth month, like the festival held in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. This he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves he had made. And at Bethel, he also installed priests at the high places he had made. And on the 15th day of the eighth month, a month of his own choosing. This is all his own choosing. None of this is from God. It's of his own choosing. He offered sacrifices on the altar he had built at Bethel. So he instituted the festival for the Israelites. It went up to the altar to make offerings. So not only does he create these golden calves and, and gives the calves credit as idols for bringing the people out of Egypt, you know, half a millennium before, he creates a whole religion. He's got priests. He's got places. He's got... Um, festivals and the, the whole structure. He just sort of, on his own choosing, he just sort of builds one himself. It is the great sin um, after, af, after David and Solomon. And, and when you encounter um, a, a bad king, the worst king that he could be measured against is Jeroboam. Or you might have a king where the Bible says he, he he was bad, but he wasn't as bad as Jeroboam because this is awful, and it's a it 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 is a a replay and worse with the priests and the and 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 the the little temples, the shrines, and the and the fest festivals and all this he just creates. You know, he's like some religious entrepreneur or something. And why does he do it? Is, does, does he even do it out of some sincere religious belief? No. He does it because he's afraid that the people are going to go down to Jerusalem and worship and they're going to return to Rehoboam and Jeroboam is going to be on the outs and be killed for it. That's it. It's about power and, and survival and... Yep, it's quite something. So, any reflections on that, Patty? Any Anything you would like to add? Scott, a few years ago when we went to Israel, we went to, uh, it was a very difficult place to reach, but we went to a place that was called Tel Dan. That's the place. And that is that right where the altar was built for yes. those who were with us on that trip? Yes. Okay. Right there. It's a hard place to get to, and we had... A number of people on the trip who couldn't get back there, so we haven't been back. Um, Extremely difficult. Yeah. Rough yeah, terrain. Yeah, and, and there isn't really much there to see, but but that is the place. That is the that, place. That's kind of amazing that is, that is still marked as that's, the Well, place. archaeologists, in, you know, they dig stuff out, they yeah. dig it up, and they want to they wanna find it. What's interesting is is that at Tel Dan, about 30 years ago, give or take, um, they found a... Steely, S-T-E-L-E. A steely is a stone slab on which a bunch of stuff is written. So they found a stone steely, um, which is kind of redundant. They found a steely, and on it is some writing that specifically refers to the house of David. And until that had been found about 30 years ago, there had not been found any specific reference in archaeology to the house of David. 
because it's, it's again three thousand years ago, and, and and most of what archaeologists could dig up hasn't been dug up, and what has been dug up, a little of it actually been studied and cataloged and all the rest of it. But they did find this stele up at Dan, way up there in the north, that refers to the house of David. So, so you mean like outside scripture? Yeah, yeah it's just like, it's just it's just, just some kind of think of it as a government document wow. that refers to the house of David. But it was really good, you know, I mean, for those who would need confirmation of there having been a David and of there having been a house of David and stuff, you know, it was good for them. For most of us, I don't think we, we would need that, but because we have these documents that we're reading right now. So, okay. So, back to the bottom of Mount Sinai, verse 21. And Moses' confrontation with Aaron. <coughs> so we're back in Exodus. Exodus 32, 32. verse 21. <coughs> okay. Exodus 32, verse 21. Moses said to Aaron, What did these people do to you that you led them into such great sin? And Aaron answered, Do not be angry, my Lord. And that Lord is referring to Moses. Even though Aaron is the elder, he knows that Moses is the guy. You know how prone these people are to evil. They said to me, Make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. So I told him, Innocent little me, Whoever has any gold jewelry, take it off. And they gave me the gold, you know, and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. Wow. I guess <clears throat> I'm betting there have been times in our lives, maybe when we were a lot younger, maybe when we were kids, when we were confronted with something that we were unwilling to admit and we make up some outlandish lie about it. Well, let me tell you, Aaron is way too old for that. Right? This is only making his guilt more evident. Right? This this is compounding it. This is... This is becoming not just, not, it, it's the people's sin, but it's Aaron's sin. This is Aaron's rebellion. I, they just gave me their earrings and I threw them in the fire and, you know, boom, up pops this, uh, this golden calf. Uh, I think, you know, Aaron just, he wasn't <laughs> on the inside that, he knew that Moses found out about 10, 15 verses before that God himself told Moses but that you, they have cast this gold into this calf. But Aaron should know. Aaron yes. went. With, Aaron was with Moses in Egypt, confronting Pharaohs, being Moses' voice. Remember, God would speak to Moses, Moses would speak to Aaron, and Aaron would speak to Pharaoh. Wow. And here, it's just, you know... Every time I come to one of these stories like this and I'm reminded of God's grace and God's mercy and God's forgiveness and because they're just, this is, yeah, th this is outrageous, but there are a lot of outrageous stories in the Old Testament. Heck, there are a lot of outrageous stories in the New Testament. But it does crack. This one does crack me up. They gave me the gold. I tossed it in the fire, and out pops the golden calf, calf like some sort of uh, uh, what do they call those things you, you you put in the toaster for a little breakfast? Pop tarts. Like pop tarts. Yeah, you see, I don't eat them, so I can't I can't remember the name. But when I when I was young, boy, they were good. I was actually picturing an easy bake oven myself. <laughs> <laughs> With the light bulb in it, yes. Yeah, those. Yeah, I didn't have one of those. I, I, I'm you know, glad. I'm yeah, glad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think I had too much gender confusion as a kid. So, 
Verse 25, Moses saw that the people were running wild. Not had run wild, they were running wild. You know, so this is not only idolatry, which is the, which is the making of, of an idol, right? To worship and as they would worship God um, or to think that they are somehow representing God in this calf or something, but they're also just completely and utterly out of control. In revelry, I'm sure in drinking, I'm sure in sex, and who knows what else. They were running wild. And that Aaron had let them get out of control and so become a laughingstock to their enemies. A lot in the Old Testament is concerned with how God's people will be seen, their reputation. And honestly, the Hebrew here is vague. It, it, it could be their enemies would see them in, in wildness and, and laugh at them, as which is the choice of the NIV translators. But honestly, the Hebrew could also be read, well, they're wild, they're running out of control, and it, and it would frighten their enemies. The point is that Moses has the writers concerned about their reputation, as Moses will soon be concerned about God's reputation. You see, why? Why does reputation matter? Why does what people think of us, 2021, why, why does what people think of us matters? Who cares? I shouldn't have to care what people think of me. We, I hear that all the time. Jesus says to his disciples, Go and be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You are, a, you are much more a witness in what you do than in what you say. With being a witness to Jesus is not about going out into the marketplace with little pamphlets to hand out to people. That's not it. We are to live lives that reflect Jesus. People are to see Christ in us. That's a whole lot more involved in that than um, uh, than handing out, you know, pamphlets or flyers or something like that. At nine, I'm preaching the nine thirty service on January, on uh, January, January, <laughs> January on May twenty third, and it's going to be this this sentence from Ephesians where Paul writes, lead a life worthy of your calling. And it's going to be about God's expectations of us, okay, about how we are to live. And um, there's a real challenge in that. And I think that connects to this, to this idea of reputation. Now, there would be more certainly and other facets to it in the ancient Near East, but still, how people see them, how people see God, how people see us matters. As we will see as we get deeper into this story. So, so Moses saw that the people were running wild, that they were out of control, they had become a laughing stop. So he stood, Moses stood at the entrance of the camp and said, whoever is for Yahweh, come to me. He has presented them with a choice. Boy, the Bible does this a lot. There is a choice. Are you for God or are you against God? Without there being any middle of the road fence sitting on the fence, no, Gospel of John is all about the light and the darkness. You're in the darkness until you choose the light. What will you choose? Joshua, today, on this day, my family and I choose Yahweh. Elijah, in the Super Bowl, looks at the crowd gathered in the grandstands for the big match with the priests of Baal, and he says, look, if you're for, if you're for Yahweh, be for Yahweh. If you're for Baal, be free, bail. You have to choose. You have to choose. You have to choose. 
And I think we live in a time when a lot of people are uncomfortable with that idea. And here Moses is. You're going to have to choose. Whoever is for Yahweh, come to me. And all the Levites, the, at least the leaders, these are big tribes, right? The, the Levites rally to Moses. The Levite, this is a tribe of Levi. This is the tribe which was actually, you know, their, their, their namesake, Levi, uh, the father of this tribe, one of the sons of Jacob, was actually, he wasn't giving a, given a blessing by Jacob in, at the end of Genesis. He and his brother Simeon are given a curse because of the violence that they had brought um, against Dinah in the city of Shechem. So, wow, okay. But the Levites now, it's like they're redeeming themselves. They're coming and they're, they're, they're standing with Moses. And so Moses said to them, this is what Yahweh, the God of Israel says, each man strap a sword to his side, go back and forth through the camp from one end to the other, each killing his brother and friend and neighbor. The Levites did as Moses commanded, and that day about 3,000 of the people died. Then Moses said, You have been set apart to Yahweh today, for you were against your own sons and brothers, and he has blessed you on this day, probably speaking principally to the Levites at that moment. Now, wow. Okay. So Moses says that God told the Levites to go through the camp and basically kill the at least the represent, rep, representational leaders of those who are not going to choose God, who are not going to stand with God, right? And I think that's really, that's really hard on our ears and hearts and consciences post Jesus 2021 all that kind of thing and I'll have to tell you I have been myself all over the place at some time in the past I I, I might have said well you know I perhaps Moses didn't hear God well that's what Leroy Howe tried to convince me of I don't know I don't know the Hebrew here is pretty clear um These people, none of them are there merely for their own sake. God has a purpose here. These, the, the tribe of Abraham needs to make it. They need to make it and be faithful to God because they are the ones through whom God is going to redeem all of humanity. Genesis 12, 3, he says to Abraham, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. This is what God's purposes are. And he's not going to turn into, not going to turn them into robots. Not going to turn anybody into robots. The, right? God is love. And for love to be genuine, it has to be freely given. So turning people into robots or dragging them to a place they don't want to go, that, that's not it. And so, in this ancient world, a world closer to the world of Conan the Barbarian than ours, this is, this is God's judgment. This is God's way to deal with this, I guess, is to, is, is to cut the cancer out and people will see in the Old Testament often a very they'll, they'll, they'll see these places in the Old Testament and they will see only a violent wrathful God executing judgment like this and there really aren't many passages like that but they're a big they're a big challenge to us and I don't think it is, see, God doesn't change in a way. God doesn't become more moral 
over time. God is love from the beginning, now, for all time, right? That's who God is. This loving community of three is revealed to us in the person of Jesus, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's who God always has been, is now, always shall be, was, you know, that's the God whom, whom Moses meets at, at the top of Mount Sinai. But the people change. The world they live in changes. The world the world that the people of God have to make their way through changes. And so God has to God has to work with them differently at different at different points in time. I brought um as you know one of my favorite Old Testament scholars is a man named Terence Fretheim. He wrote a commentary on Exodus. That's part of the interpretation series. And I just thought I'd just bring a little bit of it to you. I um, Maybe it will be helpful to you. He says, The Levites respond positively as a group, forsaking their past and choosing now to be loyal. They immediately receive an unexpected task from God through Moses. They are to be the executors of divine judgment on those who did not respond to Moses' call. Each Levite is apparently to kill a representative number of those who did not respond. Because remember, there, if you use the numbers in the book of Exodus, which I think are very hyperbolic, there are two million people. There were 600,000 men fled fled Egypt. So multiply it out with women and children, you know, the number becomes unmanageable. But it's still a bunch of people. About 3,000. And then Fredheim notes that that is a stereotype number. That just happens to be the exact number of the Philistines on the roof when, when Goliath, not Goliath, when Samson is chained up. So it's a number, with, it's a huge number, really, for these people who didn't need big numbers. What do they need, need big numbers for? They could have basically only count to a thousand and then count some thousands on top of that, I guess. They didn't need really big numbers like we do now. But um, he said about 3,000, a stereotype number, are killed according to the word of Moses. And maybe Leroy Howe is right. I should see in this only that Moses wasn't really hearing God well. Because this, this isn't written in a way that it says, the Lord said to Moses, go do this thing. It just Moses just says, boom, God says do this. So maybe Moses is taking upon himself a way of dealing with this cancer that he shouldn't. It, it does say that, that though, Scott. It says, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. But Each man strap a sword on and go back and forth and but there are a lot of places in the Old Testament where, where what it says is, this is what the Lord said to Moses and then quotes it. You okay. see the difference? Moses is just saying, this is what God told me. The text is not saying, this is, this is what God said to Moses. I don't know. That, you know. This is why I challenged the great Leroy Howe about this one time. Scott, you do have a question from yeah. Susan um, Faulkner. Hi, Susan. Um, Aaron is the one asking them to give him the gold, and he formed the calf. So I wonder why he didn't get in trouble, you know, with the rest of them. Presumably, when, when, what is the question? Okay, so what's happening? That's a really, really good question, Susan, because I didn't bring this out. Okay. Is this act of judgment because of what happened at the bottom of the mountain. The golden calf, the wild party. No. It's because Moses said, come stand with me if you are Yahweh's. It is, it is in response to the choice. So Aaron is evidently making the right choice. He is from the tribe of Levi. He is making the choice. Eve, despite what he had done in, in, in 
in helping the people make this golden calf and leading them to making this golden calf, he, when confronted with a choice, God, not God, God, not God, he has chosen for God. That's, that's what the judgment is about. It's not about, it's not really about the making of the golden calf. Be, that's what makes the question, verse 26, whoever is for Yahweh come to me, so important to realize that, that what, what, what that statement is. Whoever is for Yahweh come to me. And then there is the judgment. You see? Is that, you, you see what I'm saying, Patty? I do. Okay. I do. Okay. That was a really good question because I did not make enough deal out of, out of seeing that this is about, it's the same thing as at, what happens to, okay, so let's go to the Super Bowl in the Book of Kings. I was just thinking of that. What happens after the, after a lie, after God wins the yes. Super Bowl yes. in First Kings 18, what happens, Patty? It's a slaughter. Total slaughter. Yeah, Elijah Awful. and and his his guys, they go through and they slaughter the priests of Baal. These are fellow Israelites. They're not they're, they're not imports from elsewhere. These are Israelites who have abandoned God and have embraced this pagan god Baal. Yeah. So, wow. You do have um, one other comment I'm uh -huh. going to mention here, and then I was going to tell you something I was thinking about. Patty Hoff asks, I would think that Moses would be out of favor with God if it was not God's direction. Yes. Yes, Patty. That's another reason to, to, for that, you know, for, to think that this, this teacher, this very wise SMU teacher, wasn't really right about, about, about that. Okay, so this is what I was thinking, which is okay. in a different direction. When God sees this, what's happening down there, his anger is so fierce, he tells Moses, I'm going to destroy them all. And Moses pleads with God, don't, don't destroy them, please. He goes down the hill, pretty much gives everybody a second chance. He does give them all a second does, chance. Where God wanted to destroy all of them before Moses pleaded with him. So I don't think that this is completely out of character that this would have been God's will in this particular that's case. Why I abandoned, that's why I abandoned the way of saying that wasn't really God behind this. And the thing is to see that you're, you're right, Patty. It is none of this has to happen. All that needed to happen was when Moses says, all right, all right, whoever's for Yahweh, come to me. And if everybody had come to Moses, you can sort of picture the line in the sand, I guess. Or yes. If everybody had come to Moses, then none of this would have happened. Right? There would have been no Levites running around with swords slaying people. Nope, nope, nope. This also reminds me of another, this is kind of a Scottism because you're asked so many times by people, <laughs> this is, this is a little controversial, but you, um, people will say sometimes, well, what if, you know, what if somebody does die and even though they had heard about Jesus, they wouldn't accept Jesus in their life. And you have said, I've heard it at least a couple thousand times <laughs> that your hope and prayer is that... And you don't find it anywhere in the Bible to to be um, differing and, with with what you're saying. That um, you hold out hope that there will be another chance that Jesus will say. In part, I always say that because I've had like fifty seven chances or something. All, but all of us but have. but none of these people have had the opportunity to be Jesus. They and we met Jesus, but they are still shaking their fist. They're shaking their fist at God. At God. But what if they had had the chance to meet Jesus? We don't know. What if after they're slaughtered here, they do have a they chance to meet Jesus? They get a third chance then. Good they thing I've had a lot more than three. They make it I'm a chance just... after they failed the second chance. They make it the third chance. But <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah. to me, those who did not accept it that day, not accept Those not who chose against God. God. They are shaking their fist. They now, are. They want to continue in this crazy wild way that we are versus you know yep, that's exactly it they, they they made their choice they made their choice so let's just maybe give you a little bit more from fretheim about this 
since I did print it out, really. In big font, I hope. Big font, <laughs> plenty of space, bolded, and 16 point. Okay, for this juncture in Israel's life, when its entire future is at stake, back to the purpose question, right? Radical sin is believed to call for radical measures. Continued life with the community is believed to be possible only through the death of some. Declining Moses' call to stand for Yahweh is not an open matter for Israel. The relationship with God even takes priority over all other relationships. And then he refers to the time Jesus says, you know, who's my father? Who's my brother? Who's my mother? That our, our, our allegiance to God, our loyalty to Jesus, that is, the, that is the most important relationship in our lives, above all the other relationships in our lives. Friend time goes on. The seriousness with which Israel takes the matter should occasion critical reflection by those of us who live in an age where virtually anything that goes by the name of religion is tolerated. You know, it's something I've reflected on in the past is you could go to the Lauren Sandstedt and I were talking about this um, a couple of days ago in the, his the history of the Christian church. In the early centuries, the shape of Christianity and what people affirmed or didn't affirm really mattered to these early Christians. They really had substantive arguments about this, many of which are blessedly were captured for us in their writings and passed on to us, but it really mattered to them whether Jesus was resurrected. It mattered to them whether we will one day be resurrected to them. It mattered to them whether Jesus was really, truly, fully God and fully human. At the, at the Council of Nicaea in uh, 325, the story is that St. Nicholas walked up and slapped a heretical bishop, Bishop Arius, who denied the full divinity of Jesus, slapped them, right? We don't live in a world which, which takes any of this very seriously anymore. So anyway, that is the story, okay? That is the story. It's a serious story. Um, and don't just, just grasp, don't forget that it begins not with the golden calf at the bottom. It be, it's about the choice. See, they've made the choice for God before. How many times did they reiterate um, that they were good with the covenant? Are you down for the covenant? We're down. Yeah, we're good. We're good. We're on. Let's go. Let's go. So now Moses has said again, whoever's for Yahweh come to be. But some don't. Some choose against God. And, and that particular cancer won't go on with them from here. So let's see what happens next then. The next day, Moses said to the people, you have committed a great sin. Now he's talking about what? The golden calf. But now I will go up to Yahweh. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Perhaps. Atonement is to bring... The, is to close the gap between God and his people, to put them at one as best. It might be, you know, might be a, a weak imitation of the real thing, but to make atonement for your sin and put, and, and put, let's put, I'm going to try to put you and God back to where you should be. Does that mean, Okay. So Moses went back to Yahweh and he said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. But now, please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. Okay, so... Moses pleads their case. This is 
this is what's called intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is to pray to God on the behalf of others. So Moses, in this case, is praying to God, approaching God, conversing with God, pleading with God on behalf of others who the people of Israel for the sin that they have committed down at the bottom of Mount Sinai with the golden calf and all of that. And it seems, I'm certainly with those who says, who believe that what Moses is doing, he says, well, if you can't forgive their sin, then put it on me. Blot my name out of the book that you have written. So this book is referred to a couple of times in the um, Old Testament, and this is almost, almost certainly, I don't, I, almost certainly the book of life that you encounter at the end of the book of Revelation. Because remember, um, and Revelation as a book is dripping in the Old Testament. So, so it seems to certainly be that same book, this book of life in which is written the names of those who will enter into eternity with God. And so I think, it seems, this is how I read this, and a lot of people read this, that Moses is offering himself up in their place. Blot me out of that book if you can't forgive their sin. And I think, for me, maybe for you, it's a, it's, it, it's, it's a, um, it's a sign of, post to Jesus. It's just really a pretty special moment. But now, please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot my name, blot me out of the book you have written, this book of life, in which names are inscribed and presumably taken out. I don't know whether they could be put back. I'm Perhaps, I don't know. It's not my book. It's God's book. Please forgive their sin, but if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. And Yahweh replied to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. Now go. Lead the people to the place I spoke of, and my angel will go before you. So that first line, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. So God just basically ignores what Moses has had to say. God isn't forgiving the people. He says he's going to blot their name out of the book. You know, that's why really, gosh, we should be glad for Jesus, right? And, and, and we need to see all of this as one long narrative, right? Where, where, where Jesus comes 1,500 years later and dies for the sin of the world. But these people are caught up in that. Of course they are. There's a passage of Peter, famous passage, where it says, you know, Jesus went down to where the really bad people were, the people from the time of Noah. What is he doing there? He's preaching them the good news. He's, he's offering them mercy. Of course he is. But for now, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. It almost seems like, well, wow. What's the future for Israel then? Because... Who didn't sin down at the bottom? They all did. But God is indeed a God of mercy and grace, as you're going to hear a couple of chapters later. So he says, Now go, lead the people to the place I spoke of, and my angel will go before you. However, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sin. Verse 35. And Yahweh struck the people with the plague because of what they did with the calf Aaron had made. This is where my rational side to me says, well, this is the gold, this is the powder gold in the water, which can't be good for a person. But, you know, the people get sick, I guess, and they've been struck with a plague now, and now they're getting punished for, you know, this is this is for these people, this is how things work. 
if you sinned against God, you know, chances were bad, you know, your bad things were going to happen to you. You would you would be be punished for that. You would suffer the consequences of that. It's much more complex than that, but there we go. Steve, it doesn't look like anybody else has a frozen picture. I've got it on two different devices, and I am doing fine. You're doing so. fine. So, Sorry. you know, Sorry, these internet Steve. connections and things are so tricky. All right. So, now, what's going to happen is Moses and Aaron are going to have... Moses and Aaron. Moses and God are going to have to work out the larger bigger problem created at Mount Sinai. And the way to prepare yourself for this is to realize, just remind yourself, God and the people entered into a covenant all during the time they've been encamped here. We would characterize it as, well, a few chapters before, but of course for them it's just a little bit of time before. Right? What What's the... What's the, what's the bigger picture of this horrible sin committed at Mount Sinai? What does it really mean? So, 33, verse 1. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt, and go up to the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. Unfortunate translation by the NIV folks there should read like this. But I will not go with you, because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might consume them on the way. Consume them. It doesn't mean the same. The consume is the right word there. So now I'll explain. First of all, what do you think it means to be a stiff-necked people? Stubborn. Stubborn. One possibility. If your neck is really stiff, and stuck upright. Imagine imagine you're wearing one of those, you know, cervical collars to get well. Can you bow your head to God? No. No, you can't. Right? They are stiff necked people. They're stubborn. They're not gonna bow their head, and I might consume them on the way. So the reason that consume is better is because it it better illustrates the relationship between God and these people. God is holy. They are not. The two don't mix. And what God is afraid of is because they are so unholy, so stiff-necked, that they will simply be consumed by God's holiness. They will be consumed in the purifying fire of God's holiness. Um, as if something dropped in a kiln of that's running at 2,000 degrees and is just consumed, right? It's just, just gone. The kiln didn't really do anything. The kiln is just hot. God is just holy. It doesn't, it doesn't really imply that God is going to do anything to them. The NRSV translators get it better here. They use consume there. I think it I think it's a richer, richer way to understand this because it brings you back to the truth that God is holy and these people are not. And 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 the two don't mix. And so my metaphor I always use is the sun and flying clue too close to the sun. And so it, the closer you got to the sun, the more protection you would need, right? These are an unholy people. They don't have any protection. The, 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 co the cobbled together protection 
is are the priests and and the sacrificial system and stuff that's supposed to sort of enable them to go on. But if the people are stiff-necked, they, if they won't bow down to God, well, that system is a can't cope with that. The system is supposed to put together a people who are, be, are obedient and a God who is holy. Not a disobedient people and a God who is holy. The priests can't, can't really do that so much, I guess. Um, though they will try. I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people. Stiff stiff neck people and I might consume you on the way. Well, somehow, when the people heard these distressing words, I don't know how, they began to mourn and no one put on any ornaments, any, you know, fancy stuff. For Yahweh had said to Moses, I guess he told them, tell the Israelites, you are a stiff necked people. If I were to go with you even for a moment, I might consume you. Now take off your ornaments, and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments in Mount Horeb slash Sinai. Same place, two names. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away. This is just a tent. They haven't built the tabernacle yet. And he called that tent the tent of meeting. Tent of meeting. Meeting whom? Meeting God. Anyone inquiring of Yahweh would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent, because he is going to meet with God at this in this tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance. Think about all the imagery we've had so far in Exodus. While Yahweh spoke with Moses, the pillar of cloud is the manifestation of God's presence, right? So the pillar of cloud is there at the entrance. Yahweh is speaking with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to their own tent. Can you imagine a more holy moment? We do have that. I have two volumes of that of those books we used for a sermon series, Every Moment Holy. Well, think about these moments. The pillar of cloud is right there in front of the tent where Moses is meeting with God. Verse 11. Yahweh would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Wow. This is God and Adam. This is God and Abraham. This is God and and and. David, in a way, though I don't think it's quite as intimate, this is God and Moses. This is the this is the relationship that God desires to have in truth with every person. We love our friends, do we not? Yahweh would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. You see? Then Moses would return to the camp. But his young age, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. So when we come back next week, we will pick up right there. Um, and uh, Moses is going to want to experience... How could I put this? He's going to want to experience more of God. Despite everything that he has been privileged with, he, he, he I think, naturally wants more. He wants the full-on, the full-on experience of being with God. And um, so we'll see, we'll see where that takes things next week. So, Patty, you want to come back around? I finished all my coffee, so I'm, now I'm getting kind of jumpy. Oh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. I'm okay. I'm okay. That's good. There we are. Sort of, right? Mm-hmm.
All right. I guess I'm going to close this in prayer. Okay. Tomorrow we'll be back on with Jude. Finishing at noon. Jude. We're going to finish Jude tomorrow, which means next week on Tuesday, we're going to begin. Really, it's going to be the story from the exile in 586 to Jesus built around the books, the scroll of Ezra and Nehemiah, because okay. it's really one scroll, two books in the Christian Bible, but 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 one That's scroll. Cool. And we'll pull some, some few of the prophets in now and then to sort of flesh that out. But yeah, I think it'll be a good a good journey. It should be. Because after we finish Exodus, we're going to go to the New Testament on, okay. on Mondays. So, all Alrighty. right. Okay. A journey. A journey. A journey. There we go. Please close with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for this day. We thank you for watching over each of us, Lord, who are gathered here together to learn about your word. Father, as a group, we want to lift up in prayer today our senior pastor, Robert Hasley. Amen. Lord, we know Robert is a man of very, very strong faith, and we pray for him, God, again, communally. You asked us, Lord, whenever two or more are gathered in your name, and we're gathered here today. We pray, God, for Robert's doctors as he starts his treatment and continues his treatment. We pray for Robert's wife, Sharon, his boys, his daughter, Erin, and the rest of his family. We pray, God, that you would hold Robert close. Robert knows he's in very, very safe arms, and we just pray, God, that he will feel your presence so strongly, God, as he fights this cancer. We all love him so much, God. We feel so blessed that this man was chosen by you to be our senior pastor. We pray, God, for the rest of our church who are still very, very saddened by this news. And uh, we pray that you would, instead of making us or allowing us to sort of separate out in fear, that you would keep us joined together in prayer at this time. We know, God, also that our group right now that's meeting, there are prayers, additional prayers that are on people's hearts right now. Some of them are joys, some of them are concerns, and we ask, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that they be lifted up to you right now. We love you, Lord. We feel so blessed, Lord, to be your children. We thank you, God, for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we pray all of this in his name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Bye, all. Bye, everybody. Adios. Adios. See you tomorrow.